So Suzanne, do you think we should wait a minute or should we get started? What do you think? Sorry, I was on mute. You started the recording. I uh, just started the recording and mm -hmm. um, just wanted to let everybody know that the chat will be anonymized in the recording. Um, and uh, that just to let everybody know that their mics are on mute and your cameras are off. But um, uh, if you want to ask a question, and it's, as this please put any questions you have into the, the chat. I'll just pop in some information about how to support the notifications in a second. And in the meantime, I'll hand it over to Vivian. Thanks a lot, Vivian. Okay. okay, well, thank you so much. And um, I know that this has been uh, a week of sessions devoted to various aspects of academic integrity. And now I hear my dog barking, so <laughs> please ignore that. Um, but today's session is designed to be uh, really the wrap up and to give people a chance to ask questions about any aspect of academic integrity that they may have heard during the week or just something that you know, wasn't addressed during the week and they would just like to like to explore. So we've got a great panel. Um, I'll just introduce myself briefly. I'm Vivian Howard and I'm one of the two uh, associate vice presidents academic. And before I stepped into this role, I'd been in the faculty of management for many years um, as an associate dean academic and then as acting dean and as one of the academic integrity officers that seems like I did it for decades, but I think it was probably about eight years as academic integrity officer in management. Um, and management, uh, I'm, I guess, proud to say is one of the, you know, uh, hotbeds of activity when it comes to academic integrity. So we had a lot of cases. So I'm happy to, you know, to sort of participate in my former uh, role as academic integrity officer. But we're also joined by a terrific panel that will be able to address various aspects of the academic integrity process and issues. So I'll just get everybody to, you know, sort of say hello and wave um, as I introduce you. So we've got Bob Mann, who is the manager of Discipline and Appeals for the Secretariat. Hello. And he is, um, I think, the fount of all wisdom when it comes to any academic integrity uh, question that I've ever had. So he is a tremendous resource. Um, we've got Jill uh, McSweeney Flaherty from Hi. the for Learning and Teaching. There's Jill. Oh, you flashed Hi. on and you flashed off. How are you? Um, and Jill can answer, you know, questions related to uh, sort of the, you know, planning uh, and designing courses to avoid some of the academic integrity issues. Uh, we've got Margie Cloud Bowen, who's the director of the Writing Center. Hello. There's Margie. Mar there is Margie. Yep. Uh, we've got Anne Matthewman, who's associate uh, dean academic for the library. Hello, everybody. And then we have two current academic integrity officers, Catherine Gunn from the Faculty of Health. Hi. Who doesn't? Oh, there's your camera. There you go. Uh, Catherine from Health and Justin Roberts from, oh, and I say Faculty of Health, and that is a lie. It is Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. Hi, everyone. I have misassigned you, but yes, you're from SAS. So today uh, we don't have a presentation planned. We want to make it uh, very informal and uh, just kind of responding to your questions. But I wanted to begin with our land acknowledgement that uh, Dalhousie University is located on the traditional territory of the Mi'kmaq and we are all treaty people. Um, I also wanted to remind everybody that the session that was scheduled for Wednesday looking at um, tech tools that every instructor should know about, uh, be looking at IRC and, and Respondus, which are two tools embedded in Brightspace, as well as looking at tools that instructors should know about that students sometimes misuse uh, when preparing homework and assignments. Um, that session had been scheduled for Wednesday, but because of the uh, strike for Black Lives Matter, uh, we 
reschedule that session from Wednesday to Monday morning. So it will be Monday morning at 10 o'clock. So just letting people know that even though we're celebrating the end of Academic Integrity Week, it actually has a little postscript, which will be finishing up on Monday. Um, reminding everybody that the session will be recorded, your mics are muted, and if you have a question, pop it in the chat and the chat will be anonymized. Uh, so go ahead and pop in your questions. And I was mentioning to uh, everybody that for the session, just because it sometimes takes people a few minutes to uh, to type in their questions, I checked with some of my colleagues um, to ask if they had any questions they could kind of contribute in advance. So I have a list of, of uh, questions that I've got here just to get us started. So I'll just get the ball rolling with a question that one of my colleagues asked me. And that is, um, you know, this person said, I've done, you know, I'm, I'm an instructor, I've submitted academic integrity allegations several times, and I'm really familiar with what the process looks like uh, in my faculty when we have a face-to-face -face hearing. What's it like in this online environment? Um, could the academic integrity officers or Bob Mann comment a little bit about what an academic integrity hearing feels like when you're trying to do it online? Yeah, Vivian, I'm, I'm happy to defer that question to Catherine uh, or Justin. I understand they've they've handled. They, I know that they've handled the case um, uh, in the online sure. environment. So great. Yeah, I can certainly answer that. Um, I've probably I think I've done three or four um, since March. Uh, most of them were actually common allegations. So we had a number of students involved, sometimes seven or eight. Um, I was actually, I was fairly nervous about the transition uh, to the online environment, but we've been doing it on Microsoft Teams. And I think in many ways, it, it may be a little less stressful. Uh, we, we are able to see everybody on camera. The students do have the option to, to not have their cameras on. I ask them if they will turn their cameras on when they're speaking. Um, but we can see everybody on the screen. We have advocates on. Uh, I usually just set the rules when we start around, you know, speaking or asking questions. Um, I, I did ask some of the students, you know, obviously they hadn't been involved in one face-to-face, uh, -face, but most of them did find that the online one was probably not as stressful as they thought it was going to be. Uh, they are in the comfort of their own home. Um, and I, I do think that the process has worked uh, procedurally exactly the way that it did before. Mm -hmm. And Justin, you can probably add to that. Sure, we've um, we've been doing it uh, in fast through Zoom, um, Zoom technology, and that was suggested by my administrative system. It works fairly well because it, it allows you um, 40 minutes, I think, um, without having to sign up for any memberships and so on, which mm -hmm. is roughly how long most of these sessions take. They take about 20 to 40 minutes. Um, my sense in terms of how they're different, they're they're Perhaps um, my, I, th I think there's a little more conflict at play, and so we have to we have to work to avoid that because we try when the students are in the room to put them at ease, and I think online it's it's harder to do. Uh, and of course, obviously, with the online, um, when you go online and you're on Skype and you're on Zoom, people are speaking over each other regularly, and that takes a little bit. A little bit of time to be able to adapt that meeting setting, but but I would say that the meetings are running more quickly than they normally do, uh, and that in the past we've had a number of students not showing up to their cases when we meet in person. When we try to meet online, they're always there, and I'm not sure why. I'm not sure what the difference is. I've had about eight cases now since we uh, we went into lockdown. Um, but they're they're fairly smooth. What happens is we send a link to the professors before the meeting. Obviously, the professors sign up, and um, I tell all the professors that if they're uncomfortable with it or they don't have access to email, that we can run the meetings ourselves, which I think is an important thing to remember uh, for this academic integrity process. Is that if professors are truly uncomfortable, we can we can run it as academic integrity officers at them. That's great. Bob, did you want to add anything? Um, sure, Vivian. I mean, sorry, I shut off my camera because my internet connection is being a little bit spotty, and I just um, want to make sure I'm not 
cutting out. Hopefully everyone can hear me okay. Um, yeah, what, great. One, one thing I will say from the um, discipline committee uh, perspective, um, an, an annual experience that we have um, is uh, are, are cases that, that come out of the end of the winter term uh, that by the time they get processed or they've gone through the integrity officer um, uh, process, the student has left and has gone home. Mm -hmm. And uh, our, our sort of our status quo is in-person hearings, meetings. And every year we have a handful of students who ask to have their hearings deferred to the fall when they return. That hasn't been an issue for us um, <laughs> this this year. And we're actually handling these cases and, and getting through them and clearing them away faster than we ordinarily would. And and I I you know I don't want to speak too soon, but it's possible that one of the innovations of having to go through this where all of us have had to acclimatize ourselves to the online environment is that we will come out of it with a range of options for more cleanly and um, sort of in a stress-free kind of way, handle mm -hmm. these cases more quickly for students so that they're not delayed, yeah. so they don't stress about it through the summer. So I'm, I'm hoping that that's one of the things that will come out of it. I also have seen shorter hearings and, um, and, and to a certain extent, I think that the temperature in those hearings have been a bit lower. People have been um, uh, largely cooperative and been trying to resolve these things really, really well. Mm -hmm. Um, so I've been pleased so far with how things have gone on our end. Yeah. And, you know, I would say, you know, I haven't done an academic integrity hearing using, you know, Collaborate or Zoom or, or any of the, the video conferencing platforms. I have done them through long distance phone calls and they're dreadful. Um, yeah. So this, I, I think, is a, is a big improvement over doing it by long distance phone. Um, I've got a question from Fraser that I think we can uh, maybe unpack a little bit. And he's talking about a course that he'll be taking on this fall. He says, a typical breakdown of marks for the courses I'll be taking on this fall has historically been something like assignments, activities, 20%, project, 10%, quizzes, 10%, midterm exam, 20%, final exam, 40%. Does anyone have a suggestion for an alternate breakdown for online courses? Um, I essentially want to use quizzing formatively with maybe four oral interviews over the course of the term to assess key outcomes. Is there any evidence for what makes an effective breakdown of marks? And I think, Jill, this is probably one for you. Yes, excellent. Thank you, Fraser, for letting us know kind of the size of your class, because I think that will also help uh, a little bit in understanding the, the weighting and distribution of marks. Um, so I would suggest maybe if you do want to keep your quizzes, especially if they're formative assessments, to think about maybe creating uh, more scaffolded and low stake quizzes across the term and redistributing some of your midterm and final mark to provide a bit more emphasis on the quizzes. Um, but then I really like your suggestion also of enhancing or increasing participation. So we know in online courses, really to have students participate and engage uh, consistently and thoughtfully across the term, you're going to have to provide an incentive. And participation marks is a really great way to do that. And it can kind of help reduce the, the need to have a final or midterm mark as you're redistributing that weight. Uh, I might also suggest that if you're thinking about workload too, um, with your larger classes, breaking your class into groups. So that way, um, the marking of the discussion boards and the participation can be more confined to that cohort uh, of groups of students. And that can help reduce your workload as well as uh, the students' workload. Um, and I also agree with Suzanne, what, what do you or what are you referring to when you're talking about participation? Is it simply posting on a discussion board? Is it uh, engaging in deep and meaningful conversation? Is it creating content for the course, engaging in a wiki? So there's a lot of alternative assessments that you can think about integrating into your course that focuses on group collaboration um, or students creatively engaging with the work so that you're assessing then the learning process rather than focusing on the learning output which would be associated with a test or or um, a quiz 
Yes, so uh, posting one post, two replies. Uh, you might also want to think about um, really outlining a rubric for your discussion board so that students really understand what you're emphasizing and equating to engagement, and that can kind of guide and structure them. You can also think about maybe not having to post one one post, but three replies, because sometimes um, the replies are deeper and richer because it's going to be encouraging that conversation to unfold that we would have in a face to face environment, but in an online environment. Uh, you can also think about things such as using videos on discussion forums or using content that's uh, pictures or songs or other media to really think about how students are engaging uh, and how you can assess kind of their learning and that contextualized learning to your course content in that form. That's great. Does that, uh, does that help answer the question? Okay, that's great. And that uh, kind of leads me to a, a more general question that I got from, from a colleague um, today. And that was actually, uh, you know, asking this very type of question except in a broader in a broader sense you know do you recommend that as people are designing their courses and particular thinking about assignments you know would it be helpful for uh, people to connect with CLT and just do exactly what Fraser just did kind of you know talk through some of their ideas for assignments and and potentially with the library as well um, to uh, get feedback on weighting of assignments um, and the need for a final exam any comments from I'm happy to also speak to that as well and, and I would definitely encourage that because I think each course is so highly contextualized you have different students different years different levels different content and contexts mm -hmm. so being able to brainstorm and have some suggestions and bat some ideas off of each other is really helpful in allowing us to support you in your comforts of how you want to teach and what you want students experience to be in your course so we're certainly available for individual consults to help you think about alternative assessments reweighting the alignment between assessments and course outcomes uh, and I know the library is also available for, for working with uh, thinking about how to use technology in really innovative and creative ways, uh, how to do that through Brightspace and Panopto. Mm -hmm. Thanks, that's great. One other um, question that I had from, from a colleague is the idea of scaffolding assignments, which uh, I know we talked about uh, I think in the Tuesday session and in, in quite a lot of detail, the idea of, you know, having assignments sort of build one on the other. And the, the question that I had from a colleague is, you know, can all courses design assignments in a way so that they have that kind of scaffolding so that students are sort of working cumulatively on an assignment and it's much easier or much more difficult, I should say, for them to get into trouble with academic integrity because, you know, you're kind of following with them through their process of doing the assignment. Um, you know, any any thoughts on that? You know, do you think that um, if you've never done scaffolding before, how could somebody start doing it? How would you recommend somebody get? I don't mind taking that. I feel like I'm monopolizing the floor, but um, <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to speak to this. So yes, I think every course can have scaffold assignments and assessments. And I think, you know, in the context of academic integrity, when we see, you know, a final assessment weighted quite heavily uh, at the end, this tends to be um, an opportunity where students may feel that the only resort that they have is to engage in dishonest behaviors. And so by scaffolding low stake assessments throughout the term, you're providing yourself and the students an opportunity for knowledge checks so that you can also be responsive in your teaching. So if you notice that students have a knowledge gap as specific area before they move on to the next piece of the assignment, you can address that and support them with feedback uh, and really help them understand, okay, what do they need to do next? This also can help with, you know, workload as well for students and for instructors because they're doing small little pieces across the term really than having a really big chunk of work at the end or in the middle. So in thinking, you know, really pragmatically about the fall term when you might be juggling a couple courses in a really new online environment, this can also 
help you manage some of the workload associated with the larger assessments by having more low stake. And you can also encourage more peer feedback through that process as well, because they're low stake. Uh, you can have the peers engage in providing feedback and kind of flexing that skill set that you might not normally get with a really heavily weighted, uh, more summative assessment. That's great. Uh, and I know, um, you know, thinking through uh, how to scaffold an assignment, you know, can take a little bit of time, but I would just, again, reinforce the idea that the, you know, the folks at CLT can can help uh, work through that process and, and think about some ideas for how to create those building blocks so that, uh, you know, you have a better sense of whether students are going through all the steps uh, correctly. And uh, Joe has, uh, posted a, an interesting observation um, about a case where there were many red flags uh, in a fourth year course, a student didn't submit the last two of four scaffolding parts of her term paper. Then very late, she submitted a paper on a topic that was far over her head, written at the PhD level. Her writing on the final exam was very poor. Uh, Joe reported this to the academic integrity officer and the student claimed that uh, she took so long because she'd very diligently proofread her final version. Um, so how, as an academic integrity officer, and maybe this is a question for Catherine, Justin, and Bob, you know, how do you handle a case like this? Because this is a case where there's obviously red flags, there's no smoking gun. I mean, you run it through Urkund, it doesn't turn anything up, presumably. Um, what do you do in a case like this and how do you handle it? Um, maybe maybe I can start um, Vivian on that and again mm -hmm. you know it's a level that is discipline committee level but I think the discipline committee level can be sort of the barometer on what can do what someone can do sometimes we confuse a case uh, where maybe the evidence isn't complete or as you say there's no smoking gun um, sometimes we confuse the strength of that case or we conflate the strength of that case with the extent to which the student will have an explanation mm -hmm. sometimes we easily convince ourselves that the case will not fly because the student will just say a b and c and then what are we going to do right and we throw up our hands well over the last 10 years of doing this job, I've seen many instances of faculty members bringing forward allegations that are not really all that different than what Joe has described here. And I, I would be interested in, in knowing a bit more about it. And I noted Margie's question, you know, why, why were the red flags useless? But I've seen many cases where faculty members have said, I don't believe that the student did this work themselves. Here is my reason for believing that based on my experience and my expertise. Here's some other, yes, um, you know, circumstantial evidence, the students' other writing, their work, their performance, and this really stands out. It's really above their head. And on a balance of probabilities, I don't believe that they did this work themselves. The student is then in a position where they have to provide a defense. And I've seen quite a number, there have been a few where integrity officers or discipline committee members have said, well, we, we don't, we're not fully persuaded by this, but I've seen a lot of other cases where the discipline committee have said, yeah, we're convinced, you know, we're, we're, we're convinced you have an opportunity to provide us with evidence to back up your defense and, and you didn't do it or we weren't persuaded by what you provided us. So off we go. Um, what I would say um, to anyone who's in that situation, I would say, look, and this has been my line for quite some time now, even if the evidence is not strong enough at the end of the day, worst case scenario, you've put a student on notice that their strategies for completing their work or the way they approach their work is raising red flags and it is putting their activity on the radar of academic integrity. And if it is in fact true that they're doing the work themselves, they might want to think differently about how they go about doing it or else they're going to find themselves sitting in front of an integrity officer, the discipline committee again, 
in the future. So I, I never think that, I never feel that that's a waste of time to pursue those kinds of cases, even if at the end of the day, the answer is, well, not proven. Because at least then the student walks away going, geez, I don't want to put that, I don't want to, I don't want to go through that again. Mm -hmm. So uh, hopefully she feels not too put off by that, by that experience, even though I know it does happen. Yeah, no, that's great advice. Any, any other comments from Catherine and Justin? Yeah, I, I can say that I've, um, I've gotten exact advice from Bob a number of times in the early stages of the AIO. And, and what I've done is I've brought students in for hearing. and I'm struck by how often a student simply admits it once they're face to face, once they've heard the allegation. And so um, to again in, endorse this idea that Bob suggested that uh, we, we, we tend to assume students will have all sorts of different explanations and sometimes they don't. Sometimes they just, they assume that we have the balance of evidence on our side and they open up and they admit it. Uh, and beyond that, yes, indeed, I think it's very important to put the student on notice to say, um, and what I'll say to the student is I'll say, well, I'm, I'm not convinced that you did it, but I'm suspicious. I'm very suspicious and I'm watching you for the future. Mm -hmm. And they know, particularly if they're in FAST, they're likely going to encounter me again if this happens again. You have to realize that students who are, who are plagiarizing are often plagiarizing in multiple courses. And getting back to the idea that the student may have done this unintentionally, there's a moment in time where we can intervene and we can say, here's the right way to do it. I can't prove that you've done it the wrong way, but here's the right way to do it so you know for the future. Mm -hmm. I can yeah. add too, um, certainly in, in one of the cases that, that, that I heard, um, you know, the, the instructor brought the case for, for what they thought, you know, the red flag was similar answers on an mm -hmm. exam. And uh, when we brought the students in, like Bob said, they had, you know, a plausible uh, answer, you know, that they were a study group and they had similar notes. And there was something, you know, that as we got through the hearing that something wasn't sitting right. Uh, and we actually delved into it a little bit further, which did require a second hearing. Um, but what it brought out was we started to look at question uh, logs on Brightspace. We were able to track the fact that the students uh, were tracking question by question at the same time. And further uh, information that we got from um, CLT helping us with, with a bit of uh, detective work was that all uh, four exams were actually written from the same IP address. Uh, so it turned out that all four students were in the same room uh, while they were writing. So when that information came forward, that was a little bit more in hearing number two to say, I don't think that this is bad enough. Uh, you know, and so those sort of situations, you know, you bring it forward for one reason. When the conversation gets going, sometimes more information comes out. Mm -hmm. No, that's that's really true. And you know, the comment that you know, the red flags were useless. I'm assuming, you know, useless in the sense that maybe the hearing didn't result in a finding, but maybe was not entirely useless in that there was that opportunity for a discussion and for the student to be, you know, put on notice that people were noticing when the quality of their work dramatically changed. So that's, a, I think, a good point. Um, I'm just going back in the chat. There's so much interesting stuff going on in chat. I'm just tracing back now to uh, Leslie Fillmore's question about, you know, going back to that idea of scaffolding and, and having assignments where, you know, component parts build uh, until you get the final term paper or the final report. And Leslie is asking about scaffolding in very large classes. And are there, is this a technique that you can use if you've got a class of 150 students um, and, if not, what alternatives are there, or can you somehow um, use the same technique but maybe modify it for a big class? So, any thoughts around around that? I'm happy to share on some of the discussion that's been happening in the chat mm -hmm. as well. Uh, I do think alternative assessments and scaffolding can seem quite daunting in a large class. Uh, mm -hmm. Naturally, there is an increase in workload, but there's different ways that you can help manage that. So do thinking about uh, breaking students into groups and then having group projects. Uh, so that way you're not marking individual projects, but you're marking the group outcome. And in there, you can scaffold peer review. So between the groups, so maybe a group of students were 
reviews the work of another group. And yes, I know students might hate those, but thinking about uh, articulating to them the different skill sets that they're using, how this is oftentimes uh, mirroring what happens in the, in the employment world and the work world, and you're providing them this opportunity. And I think in an online environment where students don't have that kind of organic interaction between their peers that they would have in a face-to-face -face environment, even just being physically in the room, some of this really structured peer-to-peer -peer engagement, this peer-to-peer -peer review and feedback can be really essential in building that community and having the student feel as though they're part of a course. I know it, it is, I know students don't like it, it is something to be very skeptical of, but it's also something that you can potentially try. Now, that's not to say that you can't still use quizzes as a way to scaffold in feedback and assessments in a very low stake way. Uh, so that way that when students come to the final uh, project, test or exam, you at least have provided them with multiple opportunities to re receive feedback on their learning and to identify any of those knowledge gaps, which is really the essential component of the scaffolding of the work is to have them work through the learning process before they get to that final assignment where they then may feel that um, especially in terms of academic integrity the only choice is to be dishonest in their behavior so uh, quizzes low stake assessments self-assessment and peer review are all ways that you can integrate some of that scaffolding into a large class and leslie i'm happy to have a conversation and talk to you about some of the skepticism uh, and provide you with maybe a couple of examples where it has worked um, and um, you know talking about what would fit within your context of your course yeah. And there's some other, you know, comments in the chat as well. Melissa's suggesting that, you know, part of the reason students hate the peer review is that they feel they're just getting all this negative uh, commentary. So if if you tell students that they have to uh, include one recommendation, so it's constructive, it's not just saying everything that's wrong, it's saying, well, this part isn't so great, why don't you try this? then that can be a little bit more beneficial. Students feel a little bit more positive about it. And Joy is commenting on the fact that when students evaluate each other's work, they have to apply the concepts they've learned. So it's kind of moving a little bit further up the, the taxonomy of, of what they're actually doing in the class. So um, yeah, and and Leslie, I know you're, you're probably still skeptical, but you know, just, you know, encourage uh, you to maybe connect with, with CLT to talk through some of these ideas more to see if there's a way. I know in a, in a large science class, it seems a little overwhelming. Um, okay, so Lara is saying, I have a colleague who spent at least a week at the end of term building academic integrity cases against students who had posted a final test to an online site. The amount of time it takes to put together a case seems like a barrier to reporting. What options are there to reduce this load? Could I um, could I speak to that, uh, Vivian? Sure, go for it. <clears throat> so this is Bob. So uh, Lara, and, and and in a way, I think this also is maybe an answer, not not an answer, I guess, but it addresses some of the comments I see. Um, from Leslie and and being on my end of things, I certainly do sympathize with some of the mm -hmm. skepticism and a lot of the different things. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it's hard it's hard to speak about these things generally because of course every course is different. Um, I, I think that when it comes to quizzes and when it comes to scaffolding, at least based on what I've seen, context is critical. The design of the quiz or the the scaffolding assignment is critical and one of the interesting things that i've seen over the years and i and I, this this will get circle back around to your your question lara um one of the things that i've seen quite ironically is that students we see lots of students who have clearly done some sort of cost benefit analysis um in how they're going to approach their work and if they've got in a course a whole bunch of small assignments or quizzes that are not worth very much in terms of the course value, which may seem intuitively like a real bit of charity for a student because you're offering them a quote unquote low stakes opportunity to test their learning. We've seen over the years that there are any number of students, especially in a large course, who will say, well, it's not actually a good use of my time to devote hours to a small assignment or a quiz that might be difficult, that might take away from other work that I'm doing when it's only worth 
or it's only worth 1.2 percent on average and those are the types of courses where we've seen heavy use and we've detected heavy use of websites like Chegg. Those are the ones that are marketing that sort of that sort of use. Um, uh, yet literally yesterday, we had a Senate Discipline Committee hearing um, of, a, of a, a professor that I've worked with a lot over the years who has devoted, I think, and just an undue amount of time, uh, a crippling amount of time in past years to trying to deal with these cases coming out of quizzes in his course. And this year, he decided to do away with the value, the course value for those um, assignments and small quizzes and had students simply doing them as a personal test of their learning. They weren't required to do it, um, but they could do it. He saw an increase in the submission rates. Um, he wasn't spending all of his time chasing down academic integrity violations. Um, Instead, he was focused more on pedagogy. He was skeptical at first, but felt good about it um, through the term and and focused his attention on his final exam and and um, was able to use some very innovative techniques to make the detection of those cases. And based on yesterday, the adjudication of those cases a lot easier than they've been in the past. So I, I think there are ways of, of doing it, and I think it all comes down to assignment, quiz, and exam design. That I'm, I'm more and more convinced of that all the time. And, and those things, I think, can make the time that's required on your part to put these cases together um, a, a lot less, uh, sometimes punitive feeling when you're sitting and going through it because it feels like it's not worth it. I, I think it can be a lot more rewarding down the road if we put more time into design. Um, I was going to type something out, but maybe I'll just follow up on what Bob said is that um, really weighting of a grade does emphasize where students should spend the majority of their time and emphasizes to the student where the instructor is saying this is what is important. So with um, scaffolded assignments with the appropriate weighted grade mark, you are signaling to students that these are important benchmarks through the learning process that you need to complete and then by decreasing a final heavily weighted exam, you're also saying that, you know, this is also important. The process of learning throughout the course is equally as important as your ability uh, in the summative fashion to show what you know. So I think weighting is really important in this conversation and how you weight it does, as Bob mentioned, um, can you know, either enhance or increase students' desire to engage in dishonest behavior or even feel cornered or trapped in that they do have to to cheat or find alternative ways to be successful. Uh, we also know in online courses, just like in many courses, without students having that structure of checking in on the learning, sometimes the learning will get away from them and it won't be until a week before the final test that they say, oh my gosh, I need to learn all this. So by providing that scaffolded step, you're also providing the structure for the student to engage in the learning process so they're not at that final exam where they haven't gone through the content and they're kind of put themselves in a situation where um, the only thing that they can do to get, say, a good mark in a 40% exam it is to cheat. So there's lots of uh, pedagogical benefits to think about scaffolding and then emphasizing the importance of that scaffolding through the grades and assessment weight. Mm -hmm. And um, again, I'll just I'll just say that on Monday we'll be looking at uh, Chegg and Course Hero and some of these other sites in particular and uh, one of the presenters will be giving a case study from his class of how quickly um, giving a homework assignment how quickly his questions and answers to those questions appeared on Chegg and his advice is you know sites like Chegg have essentially changed homework as we know it you, know, you can't give homework in the same way that you used to because it's basically you know leaving an open door for students to go to sites like this and find quick answers download the workload onto a site like uh, like Chegg so, you know, thinking about other ways of assessment uh, that don't encourage or, or uh, you know, make it so easy for students to find shortcuts. Um, just going back through, you know, really great ideas in the chat. Um, Margie, you've commented on the, the fact that students enjoy structured peer reviews. 
Um, would you want to comment a little bit about what you mean by, you know, a structured peer review versus an unstructured? Well, um, yes, I will. Um, <laughs> often, oftentimes, um, you know, we, we're in a class and, and now online and, and we sort of say, okay, you know, move all the papers to the right and then take that paper and, and just do uh, uh, give the, the person some feedback. And what happens is um, they, you know, they read through it and they make some vague comments, uh, you know, which could be right or wrong. Uh, and then they give them back and that's it. And sometimes they get a mark for doing it and sometimes they don't. Um, what we've been doing is going in um, two or three times in a course uh, and with the prof, uh, we've gone through structured peer reviews. And by structuring, um, knowing what the prof wants, knowing what the outcomes are for the paper, um, we've developed questions for the students to go through so that at, they read through it first and then after that they go through a series of questions so they end up um, knowing what to look for um, and giving good comments back to the students so the students can go home and revise so it's really just trying to bring out um, the expectations and have that peer uh, use those expectations to comment on the paper uh, mm -hmm. and it's been effective um, you know we, we have a a way of uh, measuring um, writerly self-efficacy. And um, really students have improved their self-confidence in, uh, in terms of the writing through um, the structure peer reviews. So mm -hmm. It's helpful. Yeah, no, that's, that is really helpful. Any, any questions? I have, I have a whole list, but I'm just sort of pausing a moment to see if there's any other questions that are coming through in the chat. Great discussion going on. Excellent. We've got a whole idea now for a, an article in focus. That's awesome. Um, I uh, wanted to you know, also just point out that we do have uh, Anne Matthewman here from the libraries and we've, we've been letting her off, off easy. We haven't been addressing too many questions you know, with a library focus or a research focus. But if there are any questions about that angle or about how the library can play a role, um, you know, this is an opportunity to address those questions to Anne. And Anne, while you're on camera, maybe I'll just get you to maybe just comment a little bit about the sorts of things that the library can do to, you know, to support instructors um, working with their students in academic integrity concerns. Sure. Thanks very much, Vivian. Um, well, I would point out that the liaison librarians and every faculty has a liaison librarian. Um, and if you don't know who your librarian is, it's listed on the, the website. Anyway, the li liaison librarians will, uh, number one, they'll come into your, your class and teach a class on how to do research uh, and cite research in that particular discipline. Uh, they will meet one-on-one -on -one with students to help um, help them go through a research project or help them with the citation. There are a number of LibGuides on the library webpage. Um, we pointed some of them out yesterday, but there are several on, um, one with several types of uh, citation styles. There are, there are some video tutorials on the webpage as well. There's one on uh, paraphrasing. Um, there are others on how to do research. So those are the main things that come to my mind um, right away about how librarians can help. And that I would also uh, point out, and I think I did earlier in the chat about academic technology services as part of libraries. And they've got many ways to help you um, use the technology to structure your, your classes to avoid um, the questions and the problems that have been coming up in the chat today. Mm -hmm. No, that's great. Thanks, Anne. Um, you know, one of the other themes, and I think, you know, there's definitely challenges when it comes to, you know, teaching in an online environment in relation to academic integrity that, you know, are not there, um, you know, maybe to the same extent in, uh, in the face-to-face -face environment. Um, and I think one of the issues is, you know, that one of the 
one of the ways uh, to help mitigate academic integrity issues is to build relationships with your students so you know them, they know you, you have kind of a trust relationship and you know what they're capable of doing, you know, uh, you know what their work is like. And that becomes more challenging in an online environment, um, that ability to build relationships, uh, you know, can be uh, more, more difficult. Um, so I wondered if any of the panelists had any advice for instructors about that very thing that that need to uh, to sort of get you know building relationships or, or getting to know students. Uh, this is Jill Jill talking. Um, yeah. Me on the camera, so of course you know it's me. Um, yeah. I think that's a really important thing. I think that uh, because we're in an online environment and we're so used to our communications being text-based even, that we really lose the human aspect mm -hmm. behind our teaching and behind the student learning. Uh, and a lot of times that rapport building, that relationship building really um, enables a student to come to you when they're also in need or need support. And without that relationship, you know, students might result in dishonest behavior because they don't have that rapport. So thinking about how you're gonna be physically or visually present in your course is really important. So offering videos uh, weekly where you're speaking to the students, uh, offering very timely, rich, and informative feedback. Again, this does increase workload, so in your larger classes, thinking about how you might be able to do this at a group level, but really personalizing your interactions and, and being visibly present to your students is going to help. Uh, and so using things such as the video announcements, being present on discussion boards, uh, using video or audio feedback on student assignments is, again, a great way for students to connect with you as the instructor. And then also thinking about how students are connecting with each other so that if they are in a situation, they can reach out to their peers for support uh, and that they feel that they do have that rapport there. So uh, engaging with uh, student to student engagement and activities like discussion boards, uh, asynchronous or synchronous chat opportunities through um, group chats or uh, virtual office hours. These are all ways to build that rapport and build that community in your classroom so that students feel they have that support from each other and yourself. Mm -hmm. No, that's great. That's really I'll helpful. add to what Jill said. You know, I think in um, in a lot of the health programs, there are the instructors or the, the professors do have close relationships with the students, um, and there there is a lot of uh, back and forth. The students do know. You know, if if you have a smaller class, there's um, there is that rapport. On the other side, what I have heard from a lot of people that that do bring cases forward. To academic integrity is that they feel it's a it's a challenge in health where you often have, maintain a professional relationship with the students long after graduation, and they find it um it can be a big challenge to to bring that case forward because they do find it's very uncomfortable because they're thinking five ten years out. I want to add one thing here if I can. Uh, sure. And 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 that's that. I think a lot about this is like design my own course, uh, and I, I understand we need to keep this rapport with students, I understand we need to build community, but I think we might be not seeing the, the positive elements of this, which is that in, for some students, this might be a better way to build community, to build a better way to build rapport with us, because I've had many students over the years who are very nervous in the classroom, very nervous in public settings, and um, they will be much more open to to me in emails or talking or chatting or uh, chatting one-on-one -on -one with professors I think I think this is an opportunity to get those students involved and so there's that kind of that, that that benefit to this kind of technology and beyond that I would say that maybe there's a there's something about a, a generational difference that's causing us to worry needlessly because so many of these young students are already communicating largely online this mm -hmm. is not new for them um, so I think maybe that we might be worrying a little bit too much about it. I think it, I think it'll work better than we expect. Mm -hmm. No, that's it, that's actually a really interesting point because I was talking uh, just yesterday with a colleague in uh, the School of Business who was saying, you know, normally in a face-to-face -face class, it's the 20-80 rule where 20% of the students do 80% of the talking and they dominate and the rest of the students are pretty quiet. Exactly. He said, in an online environment, it's much more democratic and people mm -hmm. are contributing much more equally. 
um, and it's not as easy for one student to to sort of dominate and drown out other students' voices. So mm -hmm. I said it, it means uh, you know there's a much you know it's a, it increases his workload because he's reading you know all these posts and emails and whatever from students. But he said it does it actually has not been as bad as he thought in terms of that interaction with students. So I think that's a great point. Students, students oh, just 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 to, just to reinforce that, students struggle with conversation increasingly. I find because they're so used mm -hmm. to communicating through text. But this gives an opportunity for them to communicate not just with us but with each other. And so I think they might find a stronger sense of community. At least some of them. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's that's important to remember. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And um, you know, Margie is also pointing out that Brightspace does have some uh, built-in features that can also help with that community building. So. She's commenting on the fact that the the breakout feature of Brightspace works well for us to have students interact. We can even visit the groups and talk to students in these small groups. So you can have breakout rooms in Brightspace. The instructor can go in and talk to students in those groups. Um, and uh, Margie says that uh, in the Writing Center, they've been using that feature and she's surprised by the warmth of the relationships that have been formed. So, you know, getting groups to, to form in that way where they can have have you know synchronous discussion as well as uh, asynchronous discussion okay quickly reading through the, the chat there's so much going on it's hard to keep up um, Yeah, and then Margie's also saying that you can have a, a live collaborate room where everybody meets at times, you know, the synchronously, and students can even meet without the instructor in these online rooms. So there's there's lots of ways, even within Brightspace, that you can help build that sense of community. Um, and Jill is commenting on the fact that uh, building on Justin's comment, given all the social distancing, it's likely students will really want that online engagement and connection through their fall courses. And just as we were chatting at the beginning of the session, I was uh, telling people that right after this, um, we're having a, a drop-in meet and greet with incoming students in the Faculty of Management. So, you know, we sent out invitations to students, uh, you know, who have, uh, you know, indicated that they're going to be joining us in September. We thought before registration happens on Monday, we would have this informal meet and greet, and we were thinking, oh, you know, what if nobody comes, and what if, you know, it, it's a real flop, and nobody shows up, and nobody's interested within literally minutes of sending the invitation out we were getting rsvps you know and we've got uh, as of yet yesterday i think we had over 70 students who had rsvp'd for this afternoon and by the time the event happens we're getting a little bit worried that we might have over 100 which is uh beyond the capacity of of the room that we have uh well, yeah i think it's a, i think we're using zoom i think 100 is our capacity so uh, you know, it's it's incredible the interest uh, that students have shown in actually meeting each other, meeting the instructors they're going to have in first year, meeting some of the key staff members. So I think there really is an appetite, and people are pretty keen uh, to uh, to meet and to to interact, even if it is in a virtual way. Okay, just looking at the chat. Okay, so Joe is asking a really good question about exams. Um, she says, "My colleagues who tightened exam time did not find the grades of the grades different this spring. I allowed more time because of possible connectivity issues and to reduce stress, and had much inflated grades." Um, so when you're talking about an online environment, you know, is it ethical to shorten exam times? Or I know. Um, you know, for example, you know, some profs in uh, that I'm aware of gave students a 24 hour window to do an exam. And then within that 24 hour window, they had a three hour time block to do an exam that, you know, probably didn't take uh, three hours, but gave them that that uh, buffer of time just in case of connectivity issues. Um, any comments around timing of exams or uh, scheduling exams? I think this is a, a really great question, Joe. And you know, I'm not sure I can. Uh, I really have the um, background in terms of knowing about if it's ethical to shorten. But I do think that there's a level of 
empathy for students, students who might be dealing with uh, internet connectivity issues, students who might have to time out or reconnect. So having more time provides greater flexibility for students mm -hmm. who might otherwise not be able to have access to that specific time set or be dealing with internet issues that we know are far and consistent across you know, everybody, um, not even just in Nova Scotia locally, but around the world. What you can do, because a lot of the times that we're seeing in terms of issues with grades and um, assessments like this is really making um, the questions highly contextualized to your course. So that way, uh, even if it's an open book, even if students need more time, uh, they're still demonstrating and practicing the learning process rather than uh, being able to Google an answer or uh, chat with a peer to say, okay, well, what did you get? Oh, I'm going to post, post that answer. So I think timing is, is a way to make the test more accessible. But when we're thinking about grades and actually the student demonstrating the learning, really thinking about what questions are you asking and how are you demonstrating the learning in that assessment. Uh, I'm not sure if that helps, Joe, um, but that's something certainly um, we can talk about further. And I think it's a much more complicated question than just saying, um, should we extend the time or not? Because there's lots of different dynamics that are happening in students' lives right now, uh, not just internet connectivity, other caregiving demands, uh, different jobs, um, working with multiple partners in the host who are also working. So I think there's being considerate of what's happening in their life and trying to work to make sure that the exam or the test is easily accessible to them. Mm -hmm. No, that's great advice. And I know we're almost out of time. We've got like literally two minutes, but just a really quick uh, follow up question from Fraser. You know, could you just comment a little bit about what you mean by contextualizing? Like what would example be? Oh, I'm sorry, I missed that. I was I was reading, reading the chat oh, yeah. <laughs> to respond to Leslie. Um, the question from Fraser is, you know, what does contextualizing mean? So really focusing on um, making sure that question is talking about the coursework that's done in that class. So I think this is, might be particularly easier for some courses and some disciplines than other. So some disciplines really require uh, recall, uh, a mastery of foundational knowledge, but thinking about how you can ask it in a way that might refer to a previous assessment, uh, maybe a discussion in class or a guest speaker or a video that they watched. Really thinking about what content are, that is specific to that course that you can test students on uh, and really test thinking about the skill sets and the competencies that you want students to have. So thinking very specifically within your course uh, and mm -hmm. then creating those questions that really allow students to demonstrate the learning that's occurred throughout all those pieces for you. Yeah and you know something that I've done in some of my classes that uh, would be an example would be asking students to take a concept from the course and then apply it to uh, to their own uh, work experience or you know some uh, some experience that they've had you know demonstrate um, you know how that uh, how that concept you know is valid or or does not apply so I think that uh, you know is another example where you know because it's more personal you know you they couldn't just you know draw that uh, answer from Wikipedia or from uh, from someplace else. Um, I think that we are now just about out of time, so we probably need to stop. I think we could keep on going. In fact, I was shocked when I looked at the clock and realized that we were just about out of time. So I will thank all of my amazing panelists for all of their uh, input and all of their great ideas. Bob Mann, Jill McSweeney Flaherty, Margie Clow Bowen, Anne Matthewman, Catherine Gunn, Justin Roberts, thank you so much for all of your input and all of your ideas. And thank you for everybody who attended. The, the chat has been really, really rich. Lots of incredibly great ideas and lots of exchanges going on. So good luck to all of you. Hopefully I'll see some of you on Monday. Have a great weekend and uh, thank you all so much. Bye now. <laughs>